don't know them off the top of my head. And you, and you got a tough, you yeah. guys did a really, really good job. Like, I'm really impressed. I love how you um, talked about it being like the walk for hunger and like yeah. relating it. Because I did that after my feet. But it's something recognizable well. that everyone knows. So it's like, okay, like it gives you a good frame of reference, but you're like, it's like that, but different. It's 20 and miles, you asked me. Dreaming of the road. Does this house can hold me no more? Yeah, I've been drowning in my own smoke. But there is nowhere that I be alone. Sega's entire Shinobi Genesis trilogy, The Revenge of Shinobi, Shadow Dancer, The Secret of Shinobi, and Shinobi 3 Return of the Ninja Master. To begin with, we're diving into Revenge of Shinobi, released in 1989, and as an exclusive launch title no less. My god, even after one quarter of a century, that's one intense ass intro. And here's a quick trivia, that's actually Sonny Chiba, but the later, if recent next-gen releases did away with his likeness, thus altering it. Alright, onto the usual basic storyline. Continuing where the first arcade shinobi game from 87 left off, it's set in the year 19XX. Double Dragon 2 The Revenge much? Three years have come and went since its main hero, Joe Musashi, has once and for all annihilated the notorious Zed organization, and all was right with the world. However, they've been resurrected under their new moniker, Neo Zed, and in retaliation, not only have they arranged their payback against the Stealth Masters, or Shinobi if you will, and murdered their wise chief in the process, they've even kidnapped Musashi's soon-to-be-better half Naoko. That's some heavy-ass shit right there. Seriously, this makes the plots of the Ghosts and Goblins slash Ghouls and Ghosts franchise seem like a breath of fresh air. Now it's up to the capable, not-to-be-fucked-with Ninja Master to execute his own brand of payback towards the infamous Neo Zed and rescue his betrothed. Getting to the introductory key gameplay and control aspects, it's much like the original Arcade Shinobi game, if not accurately, in which you're treated to obliterating every lethal assassin in your way, and even assorted others depending on every next stage you're in no less. In terms of offenses, Musashi's got his close-range sword attacks and low kicks, the former of which is also used for enemy projectile deflection, and even a shit-ton of shurikens, which at the option screen depends on how many you've started with. Hell, you can even rack up extra ones throughout every damn stage, and even power them up via the POW pack for extra offensive performance. Get hit at any point, however, and you're permanently stripped of it. There's even four ninjutsu techniques at his disposal. 
Ikazuchi, in which a force field of lightning is created around Musashi, thus making him invulnerable to attack for 4 hits. The Karyu, in which 5 dragon shaped columns of fire rise up, obliterating various enemies and even kill bosses faster. Fushin provides Musashi with advanced speed and jumping capabilities. And finally, Majin, in which it's the same deal as the Karyu, except it costs you an entire extra life, so if I were you, I'd use it at my own goddamn risk. Your controls involve not only using D-Pad to move Musashi around and even make him crawl while ducking, while A, B, and C, depending on your configuration preferences, makes Musashi attack using the aforementioned defenses, jump, hell, even perform a super flip at the very peak of his first highest possible jump, thus making him fire off more shurikens, or activate one of his ninjutsu techniques, three of which are only allowed one chance, except for the aforementioned Majin. Unlike the original arcade iteration and the next Genesis outing up for discussion, you're given a life bar, which you can replenish via two types of hearts, a total no-brainer at that, at any given point. And depending on how much you score, your life bar will be maximized throughout the course of the game. Get hit way too many times or make yourself susceptible to any unexpected hazards, consider your ass a teriyaki shish kebab with a side of quivering bloody sushi. At the end of each stage, you face off against the boss, as one could possibly expect, in the form of a malignant adversary, ranging from a not-to-be-fucked-with Shredder wannabe samurai by the name of the Blue Lobster, no less, a clone summoning ninja known as the Shadow Dancer, and crap no, this has nothing to do with the Andy Gibbs song whatsoever, a super bio-computer housing a brain guarded by high-power laser turrets, and get this, various cameos of pop culture icons, whether they're from various films, comics, what have us, whose names I'm in no position to mention whatsoever, and even the head of Neo Zed himself, a merciless, deranged kabuki hellbent on making the lives of both Musashi himself and even his true love a living hell like no other, as seen on the cover of the game, no less. And in true Cybernator and Comic Zone fashion, speaking of, considering this game predated both titles by 4 and 6 years respectively, you'll end up with a shitty, agonizing, beyond belief outcome if you fuck up, well, mostly in the latter case. In terms of level length, with the exception of the Labyrinthine as Hell final stage, every other stage, a unanimous total of 8 no less, is divided into 3 parts, counting the aforementioned boss fights no less and can be uncompromising and problematic beyond all means of imagination, belief, and logic if you're not prepared. Beyond that, the controls are nothing short of a cinch to acclimate oneself to, and the gameplay engine is definitely satisfactory thanks to its ever-so-accelerating sense of freedom, despite the sluggish yet methodical pacing. Not to sound importune as ever in terms of challenge, but in comparison to the original 87 arcade iteration, this particular outing contains its own share of diversity in terms of the myriad appearances of the aforementioned lethal assassins waiting to send your ass into oblivion, the Zed Omote ninjas, normal and with wings, hence the alias of the latter, Karasu, Kabuto Samurai Swordsman, Flower Dragon Kasumi Kunoichi, disguised as nuns, attack dogs, flamethrower gunners, and even jarhead soldiers armed with machine guns and grenades, various Chinatown gangs, and the like. And don't even get me started with the random as hell radio controlled booby traps that pop up within certain power up crates. Seriously, it's those you'll definitely want to avoid like Hurricane Sandy. Moreover, the first two to three stages aren't too much of a strength to familiarize oneself with. But as you advance throughout, you don't want to fuck around too much during those instances, especially when it comes to timing and attrition within certain enemy confrontations. Hell, even in the second stage with the waterfall in the background, and even the fourth stage, Section B, to be precise, a motorized steel mill, patience and precision are huge pluses if you're willing to get any further. For example, if you jump too far with no clear cut idea of where you're about to land next, consider yourself in deep shit. On top of it all, you only get two lives, more of which you can rack up if you're lucky enough, by a certain one up icons or scoring more points, and three continues. And unlike every other choice I've covered thus far, the chances that they'll be used up faster than even a lifetime supply of ramen are somewhat slim here. Bottom line, I'd keep in mind every valuable strategy discussed so far if I were you. In terms of graphics, for Genesis launch pick from 89, the same year as Golden Axe, Rambo 3, Alex Kidd in the Enchanted Castle, Fantasy Star 2, Last Battle, otherwise known as Fist of the North Star, Mystic Defender, and the like, Revenge of Shinobi's visuals don't disappoint even a smidgen. Each and every stage Musashi traverses through isn't too humdrum, ranging from certain parts of Japan, including the Ibaraki province and even the ever-so-popular Tokyo, both the west and east coast of our beloved US of A, namely Area Code 818, and even the Big Apple, the Old Motor City, Detroit that is, Chinatown, and others, and provide a rather ambitious deal of parallax scrolling and appropriate environmental elements. 
For example, the sun sets at evening transition into stage 1, section A, with the moon in the background for the next section, the waterfalls, the disco lights and ambiance during the stage 2 boss fight, the subway scene, the crashing waves in the industrial areas and such. In addition, the appearances and animations of not only Musashi himself, which are somewhat appropriate, but the ever-so-habitual enemies and bosses, seriously, they're so goddamn damn impending that they even make M. Bison, Akuma, Gil, and Seth from the Street Fighter franchise look like godforsaken second graders. Other than that, the presentations aged magnificently, at least more so than, say, Altered Beast, but I digress. For music and sound, composed by the legendary Yuzo Koshiro of Legacy of the Wizard, Streets of Rage 1 through 3, the Master System and Game Gear versions of Sonic, ActRaiser 1 and 2, Robotrek, Beyond Oasis, Shenmue, and Namco Cross Capcom fame, the game's compositions are beyond satisfactory, fusing pop with Far East motifs and even fierce as hell ambiances throughout, thus forging an unforgettable, mind-jumbling, in a rad way that is, series of symphonies after another. And considering their age, the sound effects aren't too much of a borefest either. Especially Musashi's Warcry sound bites every time he uses a ninjutsu technique. And if I had to pick my top five, those would be, and listen to those very carefully, no rhyme intended. The Stage 1, Sections A and B theme, The Shinobi, Like a Wind, and Stages 3, Section A, and 4, Section A, Terrible Beat, the theme for all bosses except for the final, Sunrise Boulevard for Stage 2, Section A, and later, and lastly, Labyrinth, the final stage. And concerning Revenge of Shinobi's replayability, it's rather definitive to say the absolute least. Due to the wide array of offenses, straightforward learning curves, and tactical strategies in terms of attack, defense, attrition, whatever have us. And most importantly, if you're a heavy, hardcore ninja enthusiast, much like yours truly, you'll want nothing more than to continuously dive back into this and even its next two outings up for discussion, like your natural-born life depended on it. Exhibit B. Shadow Dancer, The Secret of Shinobi, released not long after. Storyline It's set in New York 1997, sometime after the previous outing, no less, despite Sadir having come and went. We could possibly imagine how far away that year was back when this game was all the rage. I mean, it's from 1990, the same year as Columns, Sword of Vermilion, Target Earth, and Musha. Go figure. There was no mention of our masked shadow hero whatsoever, following his recent confrontation with the notorious Neo Zed organization. All was right with the world once again, until yet another criminal regime arises, in the form of the Union Lizard, surprisingly, conquering the Big Apple and eradicating it to absolute shit. What's even worse, they've even kidnapped the remaining citizen survivors, thus taking them hostage. Now, it's up to the staggering, immeasurable power and abilities of the shinobi, namely Joe Musashi, otherwise known in the Japanese version as his son Hayate, aided by his pet canine Yamato, no less, to once again rise from the shadows, crush the Union Lizard's ruthless ambitions, and avenge the murder of his former pupil-slash-associate, Kato. Now, here's the big curveball concerning the basic gameplay and controls. Unlike the previous Shinobi game discussed, this is exactly like not only the first Shinobi game, but also a revamped modification of its original arcade counterpart, released not long before, the exact same year as the aforementioned Revenge, and to top it all off, the launch of their rightful console. As ever, you're thrown right into the war, exterminating the ever-loving shit out of those Union Lizard jackasses, while rescuing every hostage in the style of the first Shinobi and Shadow Dancer arcade iterations, except concerning the latter, you're recovering and deactivating time bombs, but definitely not here. Your usual offensive methods are carried over, the close-range sword slashes, and the long-distance shuriken throws, the latter of which are infinite this time around, and you can even pick between the two attack types via the option screen, in which case you're stuck with shit all but your katana. Get hit once, except if an enemy collides with you, and or expose yourself to any hazards, you're fucked, plain and simple. Okay, onto the controls. Your D-pad moves around Musashi, as always. A, B, and or C, depending on your personal preference, makes Musashi attack using either one of the earlier mentioned offense methods, jump especially between two different levels, and even use your ninjutsu magic incantations, whether it's rising flames, twin hurricanes, or multi-meteorites. But take note, it can only be used once per stage, and the only way to get bonus points is if you hindered yourself from using it at any point whatsoever. As for the hostages, every time you rescue each and every one of them, you're awarded bonus points and even extra lives, that is, if you rescue the male hostages, and even the opportunity to give your shurikens an extra jolt, that is, if you rescue the female hostages. And speaking of extra lives, yet another opportunity presents itself in the form of the traditional bonus rounds that occur in between stages. Wipe out as many ninjas as possible as they descend while Musashi's falling, and you'll score the same benefits as when you rescue the hostages. 
Thought I'd forget about the earlier mentioned pet cane and companion of Musashi's, Yamato? Think again. You can actually use them to apprehend certain enemies, especially those shield blade cocksuckers. Just be careful how you control them, because upon taking damage, Yamato will reduce himself to approximately half the size of a fucking chihuahua. Well, temporarily. Since we're on the subject of enemies, it's not just those aforementioned shield bladers. There's even swarms of stereotypical ninja warlords coming at you every which way. Gunners that fire three times above and or below and reload in between. Hazards such as flames spewing out of the sewers. Seriously, did Michelangelo eat one too many chalupas down there, or is it just me? Earthquakes, falling rocks, gunfire from helicopters, I could go on all damn day. And for the love of fuck, the bosses. Examples including a fire-breathing, earthquake-ensuing, giant-armored insect. A demonic head emanating from a brick wall, whose only means of offense are his rock-hard arms. And even a towering armored buxom, armed with saw blades, waiting for you at the head of the statue of Old Lady Liberty. Bottom line, if you're slipping up and not on your guard every minute, they'll flat out leave your ass in endless torment, turmoil, disgrace, and melancholy like never before. Anyways, as far as the overall controls, they're not much of a strain to get used to as ever, and rather adaptable to say the absolute least, and the gameplay routine isn't too goddamn repetitive. Challenge-wise, compared to Revenge, Shadow Dancer is a bit more sluggish concerning this department, though it might be on the same wavelength as its previous outing, mostly in terms of the enemy confrontation and attrition methods. But keep in mind the infamous one-hit kill penalty. All in all, although there are some instances that'll grind your gears beyond belief, the entire game in and of itself, if mostly in the cases of stages 2 through 4, isn't anywhere near Ninja Gaiden standards, considering that you only start with 5 lives, refer back to the hostage rescue and bonus round statements, and a finite albeit fair amount of continues depending on your difficulty mode. Graphically, it's much more refined compared to the previous outing. Each and every stage provides a remarkable amount of detail, if not by much, even for its day, with its usual fail-safe, if absent at times, parallax scrolling. Musashi and Yamato make a rather fitting pair. Their no detective Dooley and Jerry Lee from K9, Turner and Hooch, or Hell, in this case, either Sho or Kane Kasugi, and Balto. But they definitely know how to mark their territory no matter where the hell they go, for sure. Hell, most of the Union Lizard enemies and bosses, and even the appropriate visual effects, considering how choppy they can appear at times, even today, have been given a rightful polish throughout each stage, animation-wise. Music and sound-wise, composed by Keisuke Sukahara, despite the soundtrack being damn near close to what Koshiro provided us with from the get-go, or god forbid, not being anywhere as memorable as Revenge, they're a hell of a sensation from start to finish, considering what others might say about it. But I fully intend to keep this review as intimate as possible, while not sugarcoating way too much. And concerning the sound effects, while some are appropriate, complete with a more polished War Cry soundbite from Musashi, there are those I might have to look the other way about, especially the Ninjutsu Magic startups. And as always, if I had to pick my top 5, they would be Stages 1A and 3A, Stages 3B and 5A, Stages 1B and 4A, the boss theme for all except for the final, and Stage 2A. As for Shadow Dancer's replayability, I intend absolutely no understatement here, but it's resilient as usual, depending on your preferred difficulty mode and offensive strategies you utilize in between each play. Also definite as hell must have, especially with the unusual yet intriguing Ninja Slash K9 pairing. B3 Return of the Ninja Master, released three years after that. As the storyline continues right where the previous outings left us, just when we thought it'd be all over for Musashi, oh shit the fuck no, how surprisingly mistaken we'd be. The newly reincarnated Neo Zed is up to more shit than one could possibly imagine. As usual, they want nothing more in the world than to annihilate our famed Shadow Assassin, and with the world's most advanced artillery and ruthless adversaries nonetheless. Anyways, that's gravy, because Musashi himself also wants nothing more in the world than to see the notorious crime syndicate's operation burnt to ashes and buried to complete fuck-all. Other than that, the only explanation given in the intro revolves around nothing but Musashi's usual, if improved, abilities and his sworn law according to his dojo secret manual. As far as gameplay and controls, it's basically the same spiel as in Revenge, except this outing focuses more on speed and agility than mind-numbing difficulty and nutrition, which in some form is still existent. While the same controls and abilities are carried over, you can actually make Musashi dash horizontally by tapping left or right twice, perform a Kabe carry jump in the style of Hayabusa from Ninja Gaiden, Batman, or to a lesser extent, Mega Man X, traverse through various ceilings and girders via his arms, perform a dashing slash, and even a dive kick in midair by pushing your preferred attack button upon landing. 
Hell, even the same life bar stipulation, 50 full ninjutsu abilities, and power-ups from Revenge have carried over to this outing, so if necessary, refer back to it. Here, however, you can actually experiment with a 6-button controller, as it will be mentioned later. Other than traveling on foot, Musashi's also seen riding on horseback in his native feudal territory and even jet surfing through the industrial area through seven pulse-pounding three-part stages, no less. Now, isn't this a familiar fucking sight? Various enemy and boss lineups include the usual Neo Z, a multi-assassin, and samurai dickweeds, including one with four arms wielding even a staff. Seriously, who the hell's he supposed to be? The bastard child of Garo and Shinnok? as well as diverse types of military gunmen, even those armed with boomerangs and a shield, and can attack from within tunnels, a floating biorobotic sentry known as the Yajima, radioactive zombies that resemble Swamp Thing, living bio-insects and brain monsters, hoverbike assassins, a massive hulking bio-monstrosity that makes every Splatterhouse enemy look like the Labyrinth Goblins led by Jareth, mech soldiers that even put NCS's assault suit mechs to absolute goddamn shame, Hell, even a Mechagodzilla lookalike makes an unexpected appearance, along with a familiar boss appearance from Revenge, whose identity and name I'm in no position to disclose yet again. Control-wise, it's responsive and immaculate, yet sporadic at times in terms of the traditional super flip abilities, and the gameplay elements are nothing short of an energetic, invigorating joyride as ever. Concerning Shinobi 3's challenge, Sega definitely kicked it up a notch or two, though it's not much of a milk run here, save for the extended length of some stages, Later stages involve using the preceding Kabe Carry wall jump ability, and even making flawless as hell, death-defying precision super flips, and even the use of Musashi's customary overall physical abilities to your advantage, in order to evade even the most perilous risks that await you, including the usual timed booby traps. As it once stood in Revenge of Shinobi, the exact same stipulation applies here. You only get two lives and three continues. Concerning the former, more of what you can rack up later. The key point being is that no matter which situation you're involved with in throughout, do whatever is possible to make every potential effort to restrain yourself from slipping the hell up. And just like in the Marines, or any other national branch of armed forces, army, navy, what have you, if you hesitate, if you fuck around, you will be left the hell behind. Or in this case, Omino kids gazetai ni zen In terms of graphics, they're more enhanced and brilliant this time around, especially for a 93 Genesis game. The same year as Sonic Spinball, Gunstar Heroes, Eternal Champions, Ranger X, Rocket Knight Adventures, X-Men, Tiny Toons, Busters in Treasure, and others. In terms of animation, Musashi is much more determined and aggressive than ever, and so are most of his vast repertory of adversaries, and the diverse choice of backgrounds, set pieces, visual effects, what have you. They're an instant series of eye pleasers after another, though they aren't on the verge of winning any awards whatsoever. Need I go any motherfucking further? The game's soundtrack, composed by yet another unmatched, intrepid trio, namely Hirofumi Murasaki, Morihiko Akiyama, and Masayuki Nagao, the latter who contributed for Sonic 3 not long after, alongside the late King of Pop, harbors the most extraordinary and driving numbers ever, despite, once again, what most might say about it, you know, not being as notable and catchy as Koshiro's compositions, in which case I'm going on record stating the anti-fucking thesis. As kick-ass as the music is, the sound effects are even more polished this time around, including the uses of various weapons, complete with yet another fearsome Musashi war cry. My usual top 5 favorites are as follows. Ninja Soul, Stage 2, Section B. Russian Beat, Stage 5, Section B. My Dear D, heard during the Stage 3 boss fight with Hydra. Izayoi, Stage 6, Section B. And finally, Solitary for the 7th and final stage, with a personal honorable mention to Stage 4, Section A during the surfing, specifically Whirlwind. Replayability-wise, in comparison to both Revenge and Shadow Dancer, the Return of the Ninja Master, surprisingly otherwise known as Super Shinobi 2 in Japan, is so goddamn high, mostly due to, yet again, the customary massive offense and attrition tactics, and the far from bewildering Grigu's Vodka Clear learning curves. It would take an entire fleet of NASA rockets, or a team of experienced mountain climbers, to reach even this game's towering as hell replayability level. Therefore, my final verdict on all three Shinobi games. On a scale of 1 to 10, here's how I rate all three. To me, as always, it's a better medium than just words, despite its simplistic, inadequate nature. Bottom line, all are worthy of Musashi's legacy, not to mention those of other ninjas, fictional or otherwise, that have come and went throughout the centuries. I highly recommend all three of them more than ever, and strongly suggest tracking them down, or at least giving all three of them a jolt or two, if at least one of them, before you die. I fully guarantee and assure everyone you'll be satisfied endlessly beyond elaboration and ingenuity. 
Until then, folks, Bonsai. This is the Hardcore Retro God signing off. Many thanks for watching, listening, tuning in, what have you, and definitely be on the lookout for my next season, which will take place next month or at least before.